Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I hope everyone is having a blessed Sunday. Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful uh, for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would take and filter out all of the foolishness all of the ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Today is December the 16th, 2018. And we are back to our study in Romans verse by verse I want to take a moment to just thank everyone for your continued prayers and your continued support I know a lot of uh, these videos are not getting a lot of views but they are impacting people's lives in a positive way we've had feedback from some of our viewers who have confirmed that fact and I just want to tell you how grateful and how blessed I am that that is has been the case here and that's what keeps me going with this and you know, with within this time frame that we're in uh, that uh, or that we are waiting for our Lord's return and so we've been studying together in the fourth chapter, I believe, now is where we is is where we've come in our study uh, about twenty some odd videos, and in our last study we were, I believe, we were in the area of verses seven and eight of chapter four, Romans chapter four, verses seven and eight. Now. Before we get started here, I want to remind you of what we are being shown in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. I don't usually jump out of the, the main text uh, into something else here, but the Apostle John is, is experiencing a, uh, uh, I guess what you might call a jubilant uh, revelation from before God's throne and uh, we know from the text the voice comes out and it tells him to write it down and he falls at his feet to worship him uh, verse 24 I believe and he said absolutely do not do this do it not for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren who worship Jesus well the testimony of prophecy the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus what's he saying he's saying that the breath of this book is the witness of Jesus Christ the person and the work of Jesus Christ In our last study, we looked at blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And I pointed out how that the grammar of the original language actually forbids us from saying that we had anything to do with that, but that it was God who forgave the iniquities and covered the sins and that it was a finished transaction one of the things that we saw in the lesson with David because it pointed us back to Psalms is that there are two aspects of sin in the Christian life and, and one is that we're not going to eliminate the results of that but there's no account in heaven David 
stands perfectly righteous before God. But there were obviously, obviously, there were results which followed his actions. When a Christian robs a bank, you know, the bank is robbed, the, the, the bank and the judge is going to want that money back. I mean, restitution has to be made. But in the annals of glory, the sin is forgiven and covered through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is that man, fortunate, the word means fortunate, is that man to whom the Lord will not, and that is where we left off in the last study, will not under any condition, never ever logically impute sin. We looked at the word impute and, and reckon, the word legizomai, meaning to logically reach a conclusion based upon the facts. God will never calculate sin to those who are his own. And to say that is one thing, but to realize that it is only possible because Jesus Christ was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It isn't enough just to say that God will not calculate sin to the individual who is fortunate without realizing that the basis upon which God does that, the basis upon which he does it, is the finished work of Jesus Christ. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. that we have also been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Folks, we stand before God not only forgiven of all sin, but having been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And I think, what more could we want, you know, besides the rapture? What more could we possibly want? Now the question is, does this blessedness come upon the Jew only, upon circumcision only, or does it also come upon the Gentile, on, on, on uncircumcision? For we say that the faith, it's articulated in, in the Greek, that the faith was calculated to Abraham to righteousness. And once again, we have to look at the facts. Joshua tells us that Abraham, his father and his brothers, lived on the other side of the Tigris-Euphrates River, and they worshiped idols. I'm not saying that. God said that. God did. We know this from Joshua chapter 24. And some have taken the Hebrew there to suggest that when they served idols, well, actually what they, they did, they just actually merchandised the stuff. You know, they made the stuff and they sold it. Sold it. There is not one indication in Scripture in the word of God that some missionary went to Abraham. There isn't one indication that he heard some kind of a message and decided to accept Christ. And uh, I'm keenly aware of the fact that, that many will have, do have a huge problem with what I'm about to say. But you have a similar situation in the New Testament regarding the thief on the cross. Nobody, folks, preached. Nobody preached to the thief on the cross. 
He never made any decision. He didn't listen to any kind of message. Christ didn't say to him that if you will accept, receive, believe, be baptized, you know, you'll be with me in paradise. Didn't do that. Modern evangelism that teaches without exception that man must do something to be redeemed has really yet to explain that to me. The stark cold truth is that the thief on the cross did not accept, receive, believe, repent, or be baptized for Christ to declare that he would be with him that day in paradise. No invitation was, was even given him by Christ. The thief on the cross believed because he was one of Christ's sheep. He belonged to Christ before he was ever nailed to that cross. Furthermore, God didn't have to include that narrative in the text. We never had to know about that story, but God intended that we did. And I believe at least one reason why he did, at least one of the reasons, was to demonstrate the true reality of redemption, that it is God's work, not man's. It's a beautiful picture of that. His acknowledgement that Jesus was the Messiah didn't save him. He was able to acknowledge that fact. He had the ability to because he was one of Christ's sheep. It is the exact reverse of what modern Christianity preaches. And when we grasp hold of that fact, then we've come to understand the nature of Christ's gospel the true gospel, the only gospel by which we are redeemed. The fact that he would be with Christ that day in paradise placed him in the same area of blessing and grace that is true of you and true of me, that is true of every born-again believer, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. You can't say that the thief was not. We are, but he wasn't. And now having said that, having said that, we're going to journey back in time here to the person of Abraham in our present text. We have no indication that Abraham was ever, ever, touched by any Jewish teaching. It was Jehovah God himself who called Abraham, didn't call his brother, didn't call his father, but he called Abraham, told him to leave the gods that he was worshiping. Almost incomprehensible that Abraham would be raised in a family that worshiped idols and turn his back on that and leave the land to come into Canaan. A land that, that he didn't know anything about. Didn't have any business arrangements there. Went there simply because God forced him to go. Whom he called, he also justified. He called Abraham and God says, that whom he foreknew, he also called, and whom he called, he made righteous. So Abraham was made righteous because God called him. The evidence uh, of his righteousness was that he believed God. The evidence of that righteousness was that he believed God. Same with the thief on the cross. And how eagerly the human mind in Christian circles wants to put the glory on Abraham. 
You know, you ought to be like Abraham in your particular mess. You know, you ought to sit down and realize that you're a sinner. You need a savior and that, and that you ought to come to Christ like Abraham did. And all the glory goes to Abraham and man and none of it to God. For whom he did predestinate, I didn't make up those words, he knew them intimately, and those whom he did predestinate, he called, and those whom he called, he justified, he made them righteous. Did that come on the Jew only? For there, there were many in Paul's day who would have suggested that this glorious truth was only for the Jew. In actual fact, the, the Jew's real father is Jacob. We have Abraham to our father, that's, that's true. But the Jew was named after Jacob. He was Israel. And the Israelite is a son of Jacob. But for those who believe that this comes from some human action. Did this blessedness come upon circumcision? That's something the individual did, and that's something of which the Jew was very proud. And the answer is obviously not. If you know the scriptures, you know that isn't true, for God called our father Abraham on the other side of the Euphrates River, where he and his family served idols, and he wasn't circumcised. And he went into the land of Canaan, and in the land of Canaan, God revealed himself again to Abraham and said, to Abraham, he said, all of this land, as far as you can see, I'll give you. And the stars in heaven and, and the sands on the seashore, a heavenly host and an earthly host. Just kicking it out there for you to think about. Jew and Gentile. Make you a father of many nations. And Abraham believed God. Abraham believed him. And the bulk of Christianity says, Abraham, by believing him, became righteous when the scriptures declare that those whom God called, he made righteous. And the fact that Abraham believed God was the testimony of that righteousness. It calculates out to righteousness. It was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. In verse 9, the word for there is ace in the Greek. Some, some translations have it as righteousness, uh, some of it to righteousness. I'd say that the language clearly says it calculates out to righteousness for Abraham. The very fact that he believed God, those facts indicate that Abraham was righteous and that was before Abraham was circumcised. 14 years later, 15, I don't know, at least, at least 14 years later, he was circumcised. So the statement of the word of God that it calculates out to his righteousness was at least 14 years in our time before he was ever circumcised. 
did this blessedness come upon a physical act or the Jew only? Absolutely not. For clearly the scriptures say, and, and we have a, a we have a wonderful comment there in verse nine. I hope your Bible says that. We say that the faith was reckoned to the Abraham to righteousness or into righteousness. It calculated out to the Abraham to righteousness. Now who's we? The scripture. I believe here the Holy Spirit points out that what Paul is saying, what Paul is saying is in agreement with what all of the other scriptural writers have said. I mean, we can, we can get involved in all kinds of arguments about whether this is the word of God or not, and that, you know, and to no profit. If, if you haven't studied this, the stipulation set down for canonicity and the great care, tremendous care, and the, and the tremendous concern that was given to those books, which are included in the canon, I mean, if you have studied that, you can see the hand of God in it. Folks, this is God's word. If it isn't God's word, and if it isn't perfectly trustworthy, well, then, you know, we're all wasting our time here. I cannot imagine why many, many of the churches from which I've heard sermons or, or I've received uh, tapes continue, you know, operating. If there's no truth in this book, or if, if there's much of this book that's not reliable, speaking to someone the other day, oh, well, that passage of scripture was only for their time and doesn't mean anything today. Well, you know, maybe I could uh, apply that to something else. I mean, if you can apply that to one passage of scripture, then, well... <laughs> What right do you have to pro prohibit me from applying it to another? I mean, if that's the if that's the logic, you know, that, that you're going to take on that, and pretty soon what we ought to, uh, pretty soon what ought to be the immutable word of the sovereign, infinite God, really just really becomes foolishness. We won't reach this in, until chapter 9, but it's worth taking note of now. I understand divine election is a tough pill to swallow, but not nearly as tough as the alternative, which in fact destroys grace altogether because it just folks, as soon as we introduce the idea that God isn't being fair and I, I, I mean, I've heard this, I've heard this for 30 years. We've abandoned grace and we've adopted a system of human merit. That is, the, that is, you know, the non-elect deserved a chance to inherit life, eternal life as well. That there was the implication being that there was something good in, in man that was worthy of God's acceptance. There was nothing good in any of us that deserved his acceptance of us. Nothing whatsoever. Neither could God have saved everyone. If God had elected to save everyone, it would have destroyed grace. We would have never known a righteous, loving, merciful, forgiving God full of grace and truth. And we can't argue this issue with God and win. And neither has God, I believe, neither has he left the question a mystery. 
well, we don't understand divine election, but we'll understand it someday. No, we understand it now. The potter has a right to make vessels of honor as well as dishonor. And the potter is God. We're not there yet. Romans chapter 9. Does not the potter have the right to make from the same lump of clay one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? And here's the answer that people seek. What if God, intending to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the vessels of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the vessels of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? There's our answer. There's our answer. To make the riches of his glory known and to show his wrath and make his power known. The text gives us the answer. Belief was reckoned into righteousness for Abraham. It occurred not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So that God could say to Abraham, I'll make you a father of many nations. He said that to Abraham before Abraham was circumcised. Some 13 to 15 years at least before he's a, a father of many nations. I believe that they were physical nations, but I believe he's speaking of the redeemed. I do not think that the text is saying that Abraham is going to be the father of all the human nations. I believe God is saying here that Abraham, in his eyes, in God's eyes, is presented to us as the father of all those who believe. And there are those who are redeemed and, and believe from every nation, kindred, tribe and tongue bear in mind that the that prophecy becomes a tangled web of incomprehensible mess impossible to understand if i make the church today the extension the extension of israel in the old covenant in the old testament I believe believers today are the body of Christ, but Abraham's the spiritual father, at least of many nations. And that's done by the program and the plan of God. When God made that covenant with Abraham, Abraham didn't have any kids. He was a married man, to be sure, but he had absolutely no children at all. And some take that, I will make thee the father of many nations as, as, as Ishmael and Isaac. And there's, a, there's an interesting thing in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. Maybe perhaps you'll remember in Galatians, he speaketh of seeds as of one, not as many. That's seeds as of many, uh, but as one, and that one seed, which is Christ. The word seed is like, is like the English word sheep. There can be a sheep, a sheep, or many sheep, and, and the word doesn't change. But in the Greek and Hebrew, it does. It's the same word, seed, but it can, it can be expressed as a plural or a singular. And the interesting thing is that in the prophecy, in Genesis, the word in Hebrew, which is normally plural, is singular. And that's what the Holy Spirit is pointing out in Galatians. 
And we can look at that and say, isn't that marvelous how all this jives together and, and we can praise the word and miss the Savior? The same Holy Spirit in the book of Genesis is pointing out that this prophecy deals with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in Galatians elaborates on what he said and he was careful in the Hebrew to use a singular word seed for we say that the faith calculated to Abraham for righteousness where in in circumcision no in uncircumcision and he received the sign of circumcision some 14 years later as a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had being yet uncircumcised in order that he might be the father of all them that believe though they be not circumcised righteousness being imputed unto them also abraham was called by the sovereign god and we are called the same way i want to be i want to be careful here and make sure that that i don't become too foolish modern christianity has in many ways taken baptism as the extension of circumcision you know the the seal in the old covenant was circumcision the the seal in the new covenant in the minds of many many christians is water baptism and because of that baptismal regeneration has become very prevalent that is one of the prime planks of romanism but it's also quite prevalent in protestantism for those who take water baptism in romans 6 for example and i'll i'll have more to to say about that when we get there when we get to romans 6 then they would have to conclude that if romans 6 is referring to water baptism then you must be water baptized to be redeemed now the thief on the cross wasn't water baptized and and I, I have no idea whether he was circumcised or not I, I doubt seriously truly doubt seriously that he was I'm, I'm not in any way trying to diminish the seal of circumcision it is circumcision folks is what set the Jew apart from the Gentile under the law now the Lord Jesus Christ came not to destroy that law but to fulfill it and we'll have a much more detailed study on water baptism when we get to the sixth chapter but water baptism was basically an extension uh, I, I guess you'd say an extension to the Jew why do you baptize with water in order to manifest Jesus Christ to Israel John 1 31 the sign of circumcision was a seal it was a seal that the righteousness was authentic and it was given under the law now somebody's going to say well steve now wait a minute uh you're pushing things here because there wasn't any law yet i mean uh moses has hasn't been born and the children of israel well they haven't been in the land of egypt and uh, and they haven't been delivered out of the land of Egypt 
and and the, and the law given at Mount Sinai, well, it, that hasn't happened yet. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't law. You know, and I'll have more to say about that when we get down further. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, verse 14. Law existed. Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that was law. God gave the sign of circumcision to physically set his people apart from the other nations. But it was only, as far as the Jew was concerned, male circumcision. I mean, there's female circumcision around in some areas today, but this was not the case, uh, of course, under Israel. And the seal was that that which covered the heart, that which prohibited man from approaching God, had been removed, and that was the purpose of circumcision. It was God's seal that that righteousness that had been given when he was uncircumcised was true, and it was the basis upon which He's the father of all them that believe because that was in uncircumcision. All them that believe, though they're not circumcised, in order that the righteousness might be imputed to the uncircumcised Gentile as well as the Jew. This is a new concept. <laughs> For years and years and years, the Jew realized that the only approach to God for the Gentile was for him to become a Jew. Uh, we read in Esther, you know, after the mess with, with Haman, that many of them became Jews. The only way as a Gentile that, that I could come to God would be for a, a priest, a Jewish priest, to make sacrifice in my stead. And all of a sudden, after the cross, we have the Holy Spirit pointing out that there was a purpose of God that preceded the law and preceded the seal of circumcision. And it was imputed righteousness. And that's why we glory in such verses as he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We who were made sinners in Adam were made righteous in Christ by his obedience, not by ours. That's the marvelous beauty of grace. To declare his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word, for the privilege and the opportunity that you've given us in this special format to be able to just fellowship together over the truth of your word. I'm thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to think about it. May the Holy Spirit seal to our hearts truth and only truth and strip away any error. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.